The reasons for fighting at Antietam run deeper. Maryland is essential to constitute a confederacy. Secretary of State R.M.T. Hunter. With his second wind, Lee returns to the original goals of the campaign, to fight the Union Army before it has recovered, to play his part in the Confederate late summer offensives, to move closer to victory, and fulfill Southern hopes of a wider Confederacy. Looking at the terrain and talking about tactics obscures these fundamental objectives, leaving some to ask why Lee offered battle to George McClellan. The answer is as old as war itself and involves some of the science that clarifies our world today. The American Civil War is fought at the height of the Industrial Revolution when hard science is being applied to nearly everything, to productivity, to our understanding of how things work and how we build, and how to more efficiently destroy. Science, in particular physics, provides military theorists with analogies for understanding war's most basic principles. One of the deepest of these military thinkers was Karl von Clausewitz, who drew upon Sir Isaac Newton's theory of gravity in a landmark work called simply On War. The fighting forces of each belligerent have a certain unity and therefore some cohesion. Where there is cohesion, the analogy of the center of gravity can be applied. This idea of a center of gravity of the enemy's force operates throughout the plan of war. Karl von Clausewitz. For the great commanders, Clausewitz argued, the center of gravity was the army. In battle, the center is found at the point of greatest concentration. Clausewitz based these judgments in part on the discoveries of Sir Isaac Newton, especially the one about gravity, and the apple that fell from a tree and changed our perception of the world. But science has matured. Ours is a world of relativity, comprehended by Einstein. Had Einstein's relativity been understood a century earlier, on war would have been a little different. So it's time to bring Karl von Clausewitz up to date. Just like Einstein's relationship between space and time, we can picture war's political and military components as a fabric of strategy, the interplay between political leaders and their generals. Laid over our map of the campaign, we see Lee and McClellan bringing their armies, and thus the war's center of gravity to Sharpsburg, just as Clausewitz would expect. But we envision relativity as three-dimensional, adding a crucial element to Lee's thinking. That third dimension is always on the mind of field commanders, pushing them to keep their communications open. And it already motivated Lee's move from Frederick to Hagerstown one week ago. Logistics. Once again, it's a road to Hagerstown that will keep Lee connected to Winchester and a resupply of ammunition, food and clothing, and the men he left behind in Virginia. General Lee said no shoes, move on to Winchester. Clausewitz isn't wrong. The point of greatest concentration at Antietam is the area around Hagerstown Pike, centered on the Dunker Church. But the reason so many fight there involves the relative interplay of Lee's military mission, its political object, and the logistical imperatives he faces at Sharpsburg. But the same map that reveals this center of gravity has led some historians, and even some of Lee's officers, to condemn the general for fighting at Sharpsburg. To Lee's rear is one of America's great rivers, the Potomac, just the kind of obstacle that our theorists said should not be there. This presents history with a problem. Why would a prudent, experienced commander like Lee fight without a clear line of retreat to safety? Many answer by projecting their own judgments about Lee's opponent onto Lee himself, using the powerful emotion, contempt. In this line of reasoning, Lee lacks respect for George McClellan, thus he can disregard military principles, take risks, and perhaps triumph against long odds. In fact, the evidence shows that Lee regards McClellan as his most challenging adversary. They served together on General Scott's staff in Mexico. 
They are analogous to fellow patriots Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, allies in the revolution who became political opponents but maintained respect for one another and said so. Lee has first-hand knowledge of McClellan's intellect, strategic ability, his stamina, and determination. So using McClellan to explain Lee's daring just further confuses the problem. We can find better answers by applying the full range of options available to Lee. Generals are not bound by manuals and the theories or principles of military philosophers. Like an attorney in a court case, they can draw upon precedent, the experience of other generals in past battles, including another elderly Virginian who also fought with an equally menacing obstacle to the rear. At Cowpens in the Revolution, Daniel Morgan formed his small American army into three lines of battle, a classic defense in depth, and prepared to meet oncoming British forces. Morgan did this with the aptly named Broad River, swollen with rainwater immediately behind him. Despite the risk, Morgan's battle remains part of military folklore, an American army offering battle against long odds and with a river to the rear, like Lee at Sharpsburg. Lee is known as an avid student of American history, reading biographies about national heroes and narratives about the revolution. A victory like Cowpens and similar situations faced by George Washington give Lee all the precedent he needs to rationalize the risk. Answering the question, why Sharpsburg, involves many factors, some of which are better understood by applying other fields of study. Disciplines such as biology, the legal premise behind precedent, and even the modern theory of relativity. These elements crystallize the situation for Lee, and they offer clarity to our understanding with a simple logical conclusion. Lee will fight at Sharpsburg because fighting is his only option for continuing the campaign. And McClellan will fight there because that's where he finds Lee.